Hi, I'm Scott Davis. I'm the development officer here at the uh, St. John's Bear Afternoon. Uh, before we start tonight, I just want to tell you a few of the things that we have coming up soon. There's a lot. Uh, if you don't get our newsletter, if you go to our website, um, stjathenium.org, on the bottom of the front page, there's a place you can sign up for the newsletter. Or just stop by tonight and give me your email address and I'll put you, put you down. We normally only send a couple emails a month. We don't overwhelm you with things, but we try to keep you up to date of, of what's happening soon. Uh, we do have our gala coming up Saturday, May 11th, and we have a few tickets left, so if you're interested, I would recommend signing up very soon. Uh, tickets are $100 per person. Uh, proceeds go to the Athenaeum. Uh, it's hosted by Chef David Hale from the Academy, who is fantastic, and I, I just saw the menu, it's outstanding. Um, we're starting a new book group. Uh, and we haven't started yet, it's going to start in April. If you're interested, uh, you can sign up with Adele West Fisher, who is the librarian upstairs here. And again, you can check that out online, if you, unless you don't use the internet. Uh, tomorrow night we have Death Cafe, which is a light hunter hard look at death. I don't know if you were interested in that. That's at 7 o'clock. <laughs> That's what they told me. Well, no. so. so can I say that it's really an interesting thing to come to? I'm on the hopes that it really is a good thing. It's a comfortable, informal setting to talk about issues. And, and, you, really and you serve cake. And we serve cake, that's the rule. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we can probably serve cake. Uh, let's see. Uh, Please come join us for that. On Wednesday, May 1st, uh, we have a talk at book signing with Mary, I think it's Dingy Fillmore, who wrote uh, an address in Amsterdam about a, a Jewish family and the resistance movement in Amsterdam during the Nazi uh, occupation. Uh, there will be a wine reception after that. On Thursday, May 2nd, which is normally uh, part of our first Wednesday's program, but we bumped it to Thursday because of uh, Mary Fillmore's speech. Uh, we're going to be talking about the domes of the Yosemite. Uh, this is uh, a person from, I'm sorry, it's uh, Eleanor James Harvey, who's the senior curator at the uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum. This is going to be really interesting. It's going to be packed, so get here early to make sure you get a seat. Uh, again, that's Thursday, May 2nd at 7 p.m. And then Wednesday, May 15th at 7 p.m., uh, we have a bunch of uh, local writers coming in to talk about uh, hot topics in young adult literature, including uh, Beth Fennell, Don Breeds, C.A. Morgan, uh, and David Stoller. Uh, Kim Crady Smith from Green Mountain Books will be the moderator. And then uh, this coming Saturday at 3 p.m. is Junior Jam as our, our final event for Poetry Month. Um, High school kids uh, will be reading their own original poetry and uh, some of their favorite uh, poems from other authors also. And if you haven't seen this before, these kids are amazing. They're really, really good, so I recommend coming. Which leads us to tonight with Carol Hyman and Reeve Lindbergh from the Applied Mindfulness Training. And this is the fourth of, I'm sorry, the first of four different seminars. Uh, this one is Three Reasons to Meet Your Mind, and then the next one is May 22nd, uh, and then June 26th and July 24th. It's basically the fourth Wednesday of the month for the next four months. And they build on each other, so we hope you'll, you'll come to the next ones too. Uh, Carol will be sending you emails to talk about uh, what happened at this meeting and to introduce more topics that will be coming up. So. Uh, if you haven't already le uh, left your, your email address, please do. And without further ado, Carol Hyman. Thank you, Scott. Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, really glad to see some familiar faces and some new faces here. And I um, feel really fortunate to be able to uh, talk with you all about something that I think is extraordinarily important and um, 
uh, an underdeveloped resource in our world, which is uh, trained human minds. Uh, when we educate ourselves or when we are educated by our school system, uh, by our parents, uh, by the society around us, um, we learn a lot of things and we learn a lot of, um, if we're fortunate, we learn a lot of information about the world around us and we learn a lot of social skills and um, Nowadays, we're even talking uh, more about something that was not ever mentioned when I was growing up, which is emotional intelligence and how to uh, regulate uh, how we interact with the world. But how we develop that, to know that, that it's important to be able to um, exercise emotional intelligence is... Uh, uh, powerful uh, recognition, but the tools to do that uh, can sometimes seem kind of nebulous. How do we do that? Okay, it's, I know it's good not to fly off the handle, but how do I do that when I'm angry? How do I work with um, my emotional reactions when somebody cuts me off in traffic or, um, or I get a call from the doctor who says, um, I need you to come in, there's something we need to talk about. Um, these are the kind of situations that we tend to kind of hold our breath and kind of try to just bully our way through a lot of times, or, uh, or we try not to think about, uh, or we um, strategize so that we try to make it work out the way we would like it to be, whatever that is. There's another way of working with situations, and it comes from developing confidence in uh, the workability of our own minds. Um, and so this whole uh, to topic of working with our minds is the subject of a book that I hope that if you come back in May, we'll actually be able to offer to you. Uh, it's, it's in galleys right now. But the title of it is Meeting Your Mind. And in the introduction, uh, there is a section that says three reasons to meet your mind and we thought this is a good place to start tonight why why do you even care i mean your mind is uh, so much a part of you it may be what you identify with altogether as who you are so what does it mean to meet your mind um And I would posit first that uh, because our minds are so familiar to us, a lot of times we just take them for granted and don't even think about it. And secondly, um, the idea of meeting your mind actually as it is, is something most of us haven't considered. So I want to talk a little bit about why we would want to meet our minds and then how we can meet our minds. Oh wait, I remember, I can't get over there. Okay, so the first reason is because your mind is the conduit for all of your experience. There's not anything that ever happens from the moment you're born until you die that doesn't come through the filter of your own mind. And we don't tend to think of our minds usually as a filter, uh, but th they are, and the more, um, congested our thought process is, the um, denser the filter is. So um, I just want to do this little experiment for those of you that have done it with me before. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it's the same as it was the last time. But I want you to just sit here for a moment and just take a moment and sit up and just be here in your body. Just feel what it feels like to be here and just try to stay present. See if you can keep your attention in this moment. Attention is the currency human beings have to spend in time. This is, this is what we can actually call on to be able to fully inhabit our lives. So sit here for just, I'm gonna say two minutes and see if you can just stay present
So, anybody notice anything? Anybody have anything they care to share? Was it easy to do? Could you just stay here? Did anybody have any thoughts? It's really hard to quiet your mind. Really hard to quiet your mind. Other people notice that? Do you notice having thoughts? Like how your neck feels when you're sitting, how your weight feels when you're sitting down. Those are so. So having thoughts about sensations in your body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else that anybody noticed? Reeve. These little faces in the flowers on the carpet. <laughs> faces, faces in the flowers on the carpet. Oh boy, you better look somewhere else. So the, the nature of mind is very interesting because um, mind seeks a, a, an object and often our thoughts are the objects of our mind. So it's a kind of reflexive thing. We, we, um, when we try to just relax into simply being present, we find that that's hard to do and we mind starts to generate either things from our past and our potential future or things from our physicality right now. But there's always a, a kind of um, seeking quality. Um, do people notice anything like that in your mind? Yeah, yeah. If you don't, if you do what we're suggesting here tonight, and I'm going to give meditation instruction in a couple of minutes, um, you will notice that. That mind does just inherently, by its very nature, it seeks an object, something to hold on to. And the more tightly we hold on to things, um, the harder it is for that conduit to clearly deliver to us information about the world around us. Because the more preconceptions we have, the more ideas, the more fixed ideas we have about the world around us, the more likely we are to see the world through those filters. Uh, I believe the scientists call it confirmation bias. You find what you're looking for. So we all know people who um, can find something wrong in every situation. Hopefully that's not any of you, but, uh, or anybody that you have to sit next to all day long. Uh, we, we, all, we all know people um, who uh, change the topic whenever the conversation gets a little too raw, intimate, close to home. So we start to begin, begin to see in, uh, may, maybe we see in a, well, let me take this one step at a time. Okay, so, so the conduit, the filter, is shapes our reality. So if you're always looking for what's wrong in a situation, you will find it. Um, but with training, we can learn to recognize the underlying awareness, which uh, we call wakeful presence, which is underneath all that content. So when you were sitting there and I was saying, just be present, and you're just being present and you're trying to notice what's going on with your mind, um, that quality of simple, wakeful inquisitiveness that notices then, oh, now I'm thinking about my shoulders or now I'm thinking about uh, the person who's walking in the door or whatever it is. That simple, wakeful presence is always available to us. And if we train our minds, we can learn to rest in that state much more consistently. And when we do, we find that we are able to have a, a better focus, we're able to be more creative, and we develop confidence in the workability of our minds. How many times in our lives do we feel like we're at the mercy of our moods? I see a few people resonating with that. Well, to the extent that we don't understand how our minds work and we don't have any familiarity with the wakeful presence that underlies all the coming and going of various content, then to that extent, we actually are kind of at the mercy of our moods. 
we're at the mercy of whatever comes at us from the world and, and whatever our conditioning has been that we react to that stimulus in a particular way. But as we develop the ability to rest in wakeful presence, we gain freedom to be able to choose how we are going to respond in situations and whether we are going to give in to the habitual patterns that uh, are part of that filter or whether we are going to um, choose to, to break that cycle. One analogy that I really like for this is that the wakeful presence is like the sky and everything else is just the weather. It's just the clouds, the storms, the this, the that. But there is under all of that, just as no matter what happens, there is blue sky. I think in some ways that's one of the most remarkable things about flying in an airplane. No matter what the weather is on the ground, when they get up to altitude, you're in blue sky. So, the first reason to meet your mind is because you can develop that confidence that your mind is workable and that training it is a worthwhile thing to do. And that, that through doing that, you gain access to uh, uh, the resources that are at the heart of our human nature that we often think we don't have access to. And in fact, as long as we aren't aware of the fact that we can train our minds, we don't have access to them. What happens when we begin training our minds is that we recognize these inner patterns. So, you know, it's really easy to see other people's patterns, right? Uh, it's harder to see your own. But if you sit in meditation, if you sit and look at your mind every day, and even if you miss a day or two, <laughs> once you start the ball rolling toward self-awareness, toward recognizing and making friends with yourself. So meditation, my favorite definition of meditation is that it's the continual act of making friends with yourself. And getting to know yourself and getting to know your mind and getting to recognize what your patterns are is the single greatest gift you can give yourself, and frankly, the greatest gift you can give the world around you as well, because it gives you the opportunity to be the kind of person you want to be in the world instead of um, being at the mercy of uh, all that stuff that has accumulated throughout your lifetime and maybe throughout generations of your family or whatever. I mean, we're all carrying part of the human karmic load, and... Um, how we carry it makes all the difference. So you recognize your inner patterns, you recognize the storylines you tell yourself. Stories are very useful, just as habits can be very useful. You know, if you had to think in detail about every single thing you have to do to drive your car, you'd be exhausted by the time you got from here to the price chopper. But once you learn how to drive, you don't have to think about all of that. You just know how to drive. And if you're paying attention, that habit, uh, that, that habituation that you have cultivated becomes an ally. Uh, habits that we pick up unconsciously because we don't want to experience the world around us fully, those become part of that filter that keeps us uh, cut off, keeps us um, out of touch with reality as it actually is. So once we begin to recognize these inner patterns and storylines and we begin to learn how to rest in wakeful presence, then we gain that freedom from reactivity. So this wonderful quote that I have for years told people Viktor Frankl said, and then I decided to try to find out where he said it, and I discovered that maybe it was Rollo May who said it, but maybe we don't know who ever really actually said it, but this is the quote anyway. Between the stimulus and the response, there is a gap, and in that gap lies our freedom to make a choice to choose how we're going to respond. 
So if you don't experience a gap between the stimulus and the response, if you are knee-jerk reacting to everything, then you are just as conditioned as Pavlov's dogs. If you actually recognize, oh, and we will, over the course of the next four class, three classes after this, we will talk about how you can learn to recognize that gap. But it starts with first intellectually understanding that there is this state called wakeful presence that is un underlying all of your, the clouds and weather and all of your personal stuff. There's this wakeful quality that you can tap into, tune into. And then the more you do that, the more you have clarity about your own patterns, but also about what's existing in the world around you. So you can see what will actually be helpful in the world around you, as opposed to, um, has anybody ever had a, a situation in which you, tr you really wanted to be helpful and you tried to be helpful and instead you made things worse? I think that's a very common human experience. With the best of intentions, we can make things worse because we don't actually see what's going on. We don't see what's needed because we're coming from the place of believing our storyline about what's needed in a situation rather than being open in that situation to seeing what's really going on. And then the third reason is that it gives us uh, insight into our commonality as human beings. Because once you really start looking at your mind and seeing how your patterns operate, then you begin to see the people around you and you see pa those same kinds of patterns. They may not be, you know, you may like blue and she likes red. So there's that kind of difference, but there's liking a color. That's a commonality. Um, we all seek connectedness. We all seek, uh, or if we don't seek connectedness, it's because we're trying to protect ourselves. Everybody knows somebody, I think, who uh, develops a blustering facade so they don't have to acknowledge their vulnerability or desire to be close to people. People know that? Anybody know anybody like that? I, mean, I certainly do. Um, so we begin to see the commonality that we have and we begin to realize that, that perhaps the most profound commonality that we have all together is that we all are going to die. And the uncertainty about when that will be and how that will happen and uh, whether we will have any warning or choice or anything about it, uh, is something most of us spend our lives trying not to think about. That quality of uncertainty, the certainty of death, but the uncertainty about it, the uncertainty about basically everything, really. Um, we all try to make our peace with that uncertainty in some way or another. And a lot of the times what we do is we try to um, shore up our ideas about things and our, our belief in um, who we are and what's important to us and what, what we can find in the external world to confirm that. But this is offering another approach. This, this whole meeting your mind idea is that the, the, the true certainty that there is is that regardless of what happens, you can be awake in that moment and be aware. That is really the only certainty you've got, that if you train your mind, whatever happens, you can meet it. And um, I speak about this with great conviction because um, some of you who were here last fall, sitting right there where appropriately tonight there is an empty gap, was my husband. And, um, uh, and now he's not here. And we uh, had many good years together. And as I realized that we were not gonna have many more years together, um, the rubber hit the road in terms of how awake can you be? How aware do you want to be about the reality of this situation? 
And he and I had what I feel like was as good as good as it gets for human beings, because we sat and talked about what was happening, and we shared how we felt about each other, and we did it with willingness to, so uncertainty and fear, with willingness to acknowledge the fears that we both had, and to recognize that our best allies were humor. And the resilience that comes from the recognition that you can trust wakeful presence. You can trust that in, even in your dying moment, you can be present. And as for what happens after that, I can't testify. Uh, and um, I guess we'll all find out. But I'm pretty sure that regardless of what it is, the humor and resilience that we, that, that we uh, gain from knowing how to work with our minds is going to be um, an ally in that situation, regardless. So um, because we see the commonality, because we recognize the value of um, training our minds so that we can face uncertainty and fear with humor and resilience, um, we are able to develop the skills that let us discern what truly will bring benefit in a situation. Uh, and, and not only that, we're motivated to do it. We want to do it. We care about whether we make this a better world or not. Uh, and believe it or not, or I guess it's hard not to believe it these days when you listen to the news, there are a lot of people that don't care whether they make this a better world or not. So those of us who do care, it's on us to do something about it. And um, this is a tool you can use to be as effective as you can be in harnessing the world's greatest resources. So right now I want us to do some basic meditation uh, practice, and this is, um, we're going to do this for just a couple of minutes. This is, uh, it's so simple it almost seems like you're not doing anything. So um, recognize that that's the case, and uh, don't fool yourself into thinking you're not doing anything, because you are. So we're going to take po posture, you're going to take your seat, comfortable, upright, relaxed um, position, ideally not slouching. You want it to feel like it's a posture where you're upright and it's not a posture that you are habitually in. Like if you, you know, if you tend to watch TV like this or, you know, sit back, you want to feel like your posture is a reminder that you're meditating because believe me, the habitual patterns of your mind will help you forget that you're meditating a lot of times. So you want your posture to, to be a reminder. Then we're going to choose an object for your attention, a reference point in the present moment. And there are a lot of different kinds of meditation, but what we're going to use here is the breath. Because the breath is so always with us, so very easy uh, to experience and so very hard to make up very much of a storyline about. So you just, you, you know, you may think, oh, uh, you know, I'm breathing a little hard right now or whatever, but it's hard to go too far with that. So you can just feel where you feel the breath in your body. Some people uh, like to pay more attention to the out breath. Some people like to pay more attention to the in breath. Uh, some people feel it in their chest. Some people pay attention to their nostrils. It doesn't matter. You feel where you feel your breath the most and bring your attention to that and just stay there because the breath is constant. You don't have to do anything to make the breath happen. It happens all by itself. So it's always there and it's always available. Your attitude is open curiosity about what you notice. You don't need to judge. And if you, we're going we're gonna to sit here for, let's see what time is it now. I keep intending to bring it, okay. We're gonna sit here for 10 minutes. And um, it doesn't matter if you, if I, I'm gonna ring this little bell, you'll start by trying to pay attention to your breath. If you have a thought after the first breath and you don't come back until I ring the bell again, it doesn't matter because you will have gained some information about yourself. And that's what this is. It's an intelligence gathering process. So then you will know, oh, my mind was really preoccupied. Don't bother beating yourself up about that. 
You just want to know where you are. The point of this meditation practice is not to be able to stay with your breath, breath after breath after breath. It's not to get rid of thoughts. It's not to develop a calm state of mind. The point of this meditation practice is to be able to tell whether you are here, present, or not. To be able to tell, to see the contrast between when you're caught up in thoughts and when you're simply present. Does that make sense? That's what we're trying to do. So whenever you notice that your attention has wandered, that's very good news. As soon as you notice that your attention has wandered, you're already back. You've noticed. So then you just come back to the breath in that moment. Just come back to the breath. Any questions? Nope. Okay, well, let's do it. I'd like to invite you to, at least part of the time, uh, have your eyes open. A lot of people like to meditate with their eyes closed. It is easier for your mind to wander with your eyes closed. With them open, you tend to be more present in the room. And also, uh, as you continue in this discipline, since you live most of your life with your eyes open, um, meditation is more easily uh, integrated into your everyday life if you get used to meditating with your eyes open. So consider that. So I wonder if anybody would be bold enough to share your experience of that. Anybody? Oh, good. Andrew, there's a lady up here. We're, we're passing the mic so, because they're recording, so keep it coming. I had a very difficult experience with my I think I try too hard. You think you try too hard? Because <laughs> I get, um, I think maybe you were before, I get, physically I get, I try to watch myself too much and I get tight. Uh huh. And I notice my, the physical part of, or trying to breathe evenly. Uh huh. Well, yeah. So I just, what I want to say about both of these things is that um, there's so much power to actually paying attention and noticing what's going on. That's the point of this practice. So you noticed that you could stay present more easily with your eyes closed. Uh, 
and then you try opening multiple times and watch this thing happen. And you saw yourself getting tighter and trying too hard, doing the, you know, the good girl, I'm really gonna do this right. And so this is the kind of thing that gives you, this is the idea of making friends with yourself. This is the idea that you could actually pay attention and see how your mind works not what some ideal person's mind who's meditating might be like, but what is your mind? This is your life and you fully inhabit, well, you inhabit it as fully as you are able to based on uh, what the state of your mind is. And so if the state of your mind is constantly uh, spinning and distracted and um, uh, in, in hyper reactivity, you can't fully experience the world around you or your life or your experience. Um, an interesting thing, and I think it is uh, one reason why begin, in beginning meditation, people sometimes are told, close your eyes or lower your gaze very low so you're like looking at your cheekbones or something. Uh, because we are so addicted to visual stimuli. We, you know, that's how we orient ourselves in the world. That's how we entertain ourselves in the world. I mean, even just on a, a simple a level as, you know, what can I see? People watching, you know? We, uh, my son and I went to uh, dinner at the new restaurant down here, and I asked him if he could seat us in the window, uh, tables at the window, and then I said to my son, I don't know why I care about sitting at the window because, you know, it's kind of depressing, actually, to look at all the closed storefronts in, in St. John's Ferry. But then I realized there were people walking by, you know, somebody walking their dog. It's, it's like we love that quality of feeling connected to the world through our visual stimulation. And it makes us think about things, think about the lady with her dog or whatever. And so that's a very good observation. And I would invite you to, in your practice, to just continue playing with that dynamic and see. And what happens if you really lower the gaze but don't completely shut your eyes? And experiment and see what that's like. And with you, uh, just in terms of what you just said, I would say whenever you notice that you're tightening up and trying to do it right, uh, there's this um, technique that we call fresh start. And it's basically just drop the whole project for a minute. Just drop it. And then take and start again. And you, you will see, you will learn things about yourself if you do these things. And the more you learn about yourself, the more, uh, what's the right word, sophisticated your ability to interact with the world will be. And I don't mean sophisticated in any kind of fancy schmancy thing. I mean coming, sophistication, the, the word is connected to wisdom, uh, uh, Sophia. So the wisdom of knowing who you are, the wisdom of being friends with yourself and being able to engage the world is, um, is something we have to actually work to have. And this is such a simple tool, but it does work to deliver that. Anybody else? Anything you, you care to share? Yes. Well, I know that when I meditate, I breathe very slowly. Um, and I've used that in various ways. But I, this time, I was actually counting my breaths. Uh -huh. um, and I which I often do if, if for reasons. But I think that in itself, I mean, I, I was focusing on that, so I wasn't. And so in some ways, that feels like cheating. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a useful tool when I, uh -huh. when I need for it to be. But this time, it was like, OK, I know that I, the 10 minutes will be fine, because I know how few breaths or how many breaths I can take in 10 minutes. I will take in 10 minutes. <laughs> So I'll know when it's going to be over. <laughs> so it, Good thing I didn't try to cheat, huh? <laughs> um, actually, I didn't think it was 10 minutes. I thought it was less than 10 minutes. But towards the end, I realized I had lost count anyway. 
<laughs> well, you might you might have been right because the last time I checked my watch, it had been eight minutes, oh. and I tried well, to estimate the last I, two minutes. I actually was surprised. I had freaked as many times as I thought I was going to go in minutes. So, so what do you think, why do you, what makes you decide that you're going to count your breaths as opposed to just simply uh, being there and breathing? Probably because I use that at times. And I, the time that I use it is um, if I have to have an MRI and I know how scary that is, the, yes. the, the claustrophobia, if I know exactly how many minutes a segment of it is going to be, then I know how many times I can breathe and okay. I count my breaths. Okay. And that's how I get through. So it's a, it, 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 it's it's a, a way of self-calming then. Right, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. So this time it felt a little like cheating. Uh -huh. Well, I prefer to think of it as, I mean, that, that is a tool for people who are beginning. And actually, in some um, traditions, they have you count. Some of them have you keep counting up to 100. Some of them have you just count to 10 and then go back and start counting again. But it's kind of like training wheels. That's the way I think of it. It's like our minds are so helter-skelter. When we start trying to, to tame them, to train them, our minds are so helter-skelter that it can help, just as it does on a bicycle, to have something that, uh, that's what training wheels do. They bring you back, right? So, um, and then eventually you have your balance on a bike and you don't need the training wheels anymore. So I think, you know, uh, being willing to be your own uh, best judge about what the best thing for you in practice is, and also listening to that little voice that says, it feels like cheating right now. <laughs> That's really important, too. I, I was aware towards the end that I had lost count. Uh-huh. But I <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Well, I ended up using several different methods. You talked about how different things, like first I was just like feeling my breath in my chest and just kind of concentrating on that. And then my mind wandered for just a second, I came back, and then I was closed my eyes for a while and I learned a trick that was helping me like sleeping especially. Um, and so too, it's just picturing a black box. And so too, I just focus on a black box in my mind and that helped kind of block some things and I've used that a lot in the past. And then when my mind wandered from that a little bit, then I came back to another method I used where just feeling my breath going in and down to you know, my abdomen and, you know, and just kind of holding it and then slowly breathing back out. So it was like I kept kind of rotating my breath. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really astonishing to me, and I speak from a lot of experience, uh, at how resourceful we can be at entertaining ourselves when there's absolutely nothing going on. <laughs> it's, I hope maybe I'll try this for a while. You know? So yeah, and, and that's also valuable information about yourself. So you look at that, and, and then at some point you might think, well, I wonder what it would be if I just dropped all of that. You know, and then you try that for a little while, and then you notice your mind wanders away, and so you think, well, maybe I better come back to the breath a little bit more. And this is a natural process, and ideally, uh, an enjoyable one. Although sometimes it can feel like ten minutes is never going to end, uh, but. Uh, Part, part of that is because we're so habituated to constant um, something, constant something. We, uh, I believe our entire culture, and maybe the whole world, I don't know about other countries, but, but we, we are afraid of space, and um, we, we don't like it. We fill it up all the time. I just had a wonderful experience, uh, not so good because I have to have car repairs done, but I was out at St. J Auto and where my husband used to take his car to get his oil changed and, and his tires. And I would always say, because I hate to sit there in the waiting room, I would say, oh, will you drop me off and, you know, and then you can take me back when they're done. He would just say, he'd say, I'll just take a book and wait while they do it. So that was what he did regularly. But tonight when I went in and I, I had told them that, you know, he had died when we were in Florida and, his car needed repairs, but I'm probably going to sell it. And so we were talking about that. And then just as I was about to leave, he said, I'm really sorry for your loss. And I thanked him. And he said, you know what I loved about him? And I said, what was that? And he said, oh, he would come in here with his book and he would walk over and turn the television off and sit down. <laughs> 
Nobody, he said, nobody ever turns the television off in here. <laughs> but, but my husband was definitely not afraid of space. He liked that, and he would find the, the, the need for constant sort of in, in airports, restaurants, everywhere you go. It's like if there's not something noise going on, Maybe people feel like they're not having a good time. I don't know what the, the, the thinking is behind it, but uh, it definitely seems to have something to do with uh, uh, not wanting to experience space. And this practice is about learning how to... Uh, wakeful presence is the experience of space. And space is wakeful. When you let go, there's an awareness there that isn't fixated on the content of this thought or that thought. Did, nobody's mentioned anything too much uh, about sort of thoughts that took you out of the room. Did anybody have thoughts that took you out of the room? Well, that's a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Rehashing and rehearsing, that's what I think of it as. Um, okay, Any, anything else anybody wants to share about the meditation practice? Any questions that you have about the technique itself? All right, then I think I'm going to ask my dear friend Reeve to come talk. The other part of the, this program is going to be uh, working with journaling and using our capacity as human beings who have language and can write. Uh, to help support our mindfulness and our uh, journey toward meeting our minds. So, Reeve? Okay. But I need you to leave the meditation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love being here. I'm not a meditation teacher, and um, I find myself self-entertaining, you know, looking at the arches and this thing, and thinking, oh, Gothic arches, there are arches up there, and then I think, no, they're down, and my heart kind of breaks, and then kind of, whoo, go on and on for us, just falling in love with the breath. I love that breathing, and then you just keep on doing it, and then no matter what you might be thinking about, am I doing it right or am I doing it wrong? You're just breathing and you keep on doing it. And that, 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 uh, that has been helpful to me. I'm a counter to finding myself counting and knowing how many breaths it is for a minute, except I kind of got off, you know, and for me, I thought, oh, she stopped sooner than I did, so I must have slowed way down. But in the other, the work that I do, uh, both in my own writing and with other people, is has to do with lot with memoir and kind of capturing if that's a possibility. You're sort of watching thought and and following thought to memory and uh, and enjoying that process and writing things down. Uh, the last program that we did, um, I did a fairly um, fairly straightforward and, and uh, common. Uh, prompt practice which had to do with using your senses, you know, just using, thinking, okay, I see this and this and this, just as a helpful, a helpful way of noticing or things you hear or sense of touch. Um, I feel as if this is a, a little further along kind of a program. And what I think I'd love to do is, for those of you who, who would like to do it, is we have pens and dads and so on to help out with, to just follow. And as Carol will lead a meditation, maybe for five minutes, I think, Carol, so that we, so that we can remember a little bit of where the mind went and just see what happened, where it went. And, um, and if, it's, if it's about counting or about, oh, I'm not doing this right, or whatever it is, that's fine. Or if it's about, I'm always getting into something silly like the patterns in the carpet or looking at the Gothic arches or, oh, I don't know, just one thing and another. That's, um, I think I, I entertain myself with silliness a lot. And then not so silliness. It's, it's, uh, it's funny how our minds go and our feelings go with that. But I'm going to get the pads and the pens, and we had to kind of scratch the pens because they were new, but I think Andrew fixed them all. And so they, were, they weren't working at all, and it came out red, and then finally we 
seem to be like real pets. So we're going to give everybody a pad, and you can just take that with you, and if you want to use it in practice at home, that's great. And that's, and that's really it for me. For right so let me see if I understand what mm -hmm. you were suggesting. So I'm going to do a uh, guided meditation, and I will basically be using these same points up here, but I will just uh, say a few things. And are you wanting people to afterwards, afterwards to write whatever? Yeah, and this is actually, uh, in terms of uh, sort of on ongoing continuity, this program is different than the last one we did because the last one we did, we did four weeks in a row. So there wasn't a whole lot of time in between. This one, we're going to be uh, every fourth Wednesday, so there'll be a month in between, and we are going to have a chance to meet if you want to come and practice together and have a discussion on the bottom of the page that I handed out is uh, the date and where we'll be doing that. Uh, but in between, in order to maintain some uh, continuity and to begin to really, uh, I would say, track your patterns, um, it, this journaling that, that we're going to start tonight is something that I, I highly recommend you do. If, if you sit for 10 minutes in the morning, uh, that you just jot down that you sat for 10 minutes, you know, whatever it was, and that if there was a, a, a feeling tone or if you were completely preoccupied with something or if you, your mind was uh, steady as a rock or uh, busy as a bee or whatever it might be, that you could actually note that. Because in terms of this, uh, oh, it's the wrong page. In terms of the patterns and beginning to recognize your own patterns, that this is a very useful tool. Because as we all know, especially as we get older, um, experience tends to blur together. And you have a hard time remembering, okay, was that last Wednesday or Thursday? And did I do that or not do that? Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a way of like uh, uh, um, orienting yourself to uh, the ongoing establishment of a discipline that is something that you have not done before. And so uh, it's good uh, from, a, from a behavioral behavioral psychology point of view, it's good. But it's also good from the uh, self-knowledge point of view. So um, we'll do that now with. Great. Yes, uh, I, I have found, and I found in the last program, that it was very helpful. It's just in the notebook, I would put down the date and the place. And then I would just, after the meditation, I would just jot down. No, I wasn't writing an essay. I would say, noticing uh, light, light across the floor, or I would say, looking at the sofa where my husband was just taking a nap, or I'd say, the fire is crackling, or just whatever it is that my mind was doing. And it would, at times, kind of slow down, and I wasn't so involved in noticing. But when I looked back, I was looking back today at some of these, and I thought, huh, I'm really glad I did that. I found that very helpful. So. Has Andrew just handed out all kinds of paper? Well, you probably have. Yeah. Andrew, would yeah. you, could I have one? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mom, you can't have one. <laughs> this is my son. <laughs> no, I've got, I've got my notebook. Thank you, dear. <laughs> OK. All right, so um, I'm going to um, do a little bit more guiding than I did last time. Basically, I wanted to just give you the instructions and leave the time open last time. I'm going to have a few little prompts where I invite you to, uh, if you've forgotten your breath, to come back or whatever. Um, and uh, we will, uh, I, I'm just wondering if I could borrow your watch. Well, the thing is, it's kind of put together with Oh, here. Oh. It work. oh, no, that's great. Thank just you. Just don't try to wear it. I won't try to wear it. <laughs> I'll just put it right here. That's what I want to do. So I don't have to keep tapping my wrist, because that's what you have to do with a Fitbit. Oh. And you know what you have to do. <laughs> All right. So um, just, uh, you know, uh, this actually can be fun. So, you know, looking at your mind can, can be fun. Sometimes it's really painful, and sometimes it's really boring and irritating. So it may be any of those things. But um, 
The idea of uh, making friends with yourself is, uh, um, I think, probably the greatest motivator for actually doing this practice. If you think about how, if you've got a best friend and your best friend uh, needs something, you make space for that, right? You, you, you make time to talk, you uh, accommodate their moods, whatever, you don't say, get over it, I don't want to hear about this. So whatever it is you discover about yourself, you could be that kind of friend to yourself. You could just be there with yourself and see what's going on. Okay, so. So just settle into your body. Feel what you feel, what you notice about your body itself. Here in this room, the space around you and the people who are near, the people you can see, the people that you can't see but you can sense their presence, you know they're there. And now just bring your awareness to your breath, wherever you feel your breath most notably in, in your body or passing out of your body through your nostrils or your mouth if you have allergies. When you notice that your attention is wandering, just simply let yourself be aware of the fact that you've noticed that and come back to the breath.
Somebody else. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Rain, it's so quiet. Uh, yeah, I'll just do a sample. It's good. Oh, great. Oh, good. <laughs> Clear brain, breath, parents' memory, insulation man at the restaurant, jaw, breath, space, boxes, breath, feet, exercise, gaps, time, need to be filled for me. Breath, tired, hopefully don't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we picked up a lot. That's good. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. It's, it's been interesting to me over over the months. I'm not as regular a practitioner as I might be. Uh, over the months, it's been interesting to me to see where where, the, where these meditation theories go in terms of what I what I can write down afterwards, and um, how really how busy it, it was in the very beginning, and then less so, a little bit quieter. And I think then your breath does get slower, and you're not maybe always measuring the measuring those five to ten minute periods accurately because I think your breath does change a little bit. Uh, or at least I think my mind. And uh, this for me has been very useful. I don't know whether that's going to feel the same way, but um, I th if we could try it one more time, I would really appreciate that. And I think it, it may you may find it's useful to you going further with the, with the meditation practice. But I will ask you to get okay. started. Okay. Okay, so um, this time I like to, um, so there are a lot of different ways as we have been exploring that you can play with the technique and with your own mind. Um, so this time I would like to invite you to set an intention. Uh, and this will give you something to work with uh, in, also in terms of seeing how that works out. So the intent, you could set whatever intention you want, but you, know, you could set an intention to just simply be present. Or you could set an intention to stay with the breath as much as possible. Or you could set an intention to uh, just um, uh, explore your body. The, there are all kinds of things you can do, but you're always going to come back. With the, this is sort of where we're going in the next class. We'll learn other ways of using this basic technique to work with other, um, with with our conceptual minds and and with issues and problems and things we want to work with. But here, I'd like to invite you to just set an intention, and we're going to do it very very short, uh, three or four minutes here. Just set an intention of what you'd like to do. Maybe just, um, you know, get through the next three or four minutes, please. Whatever it would be, set an intention and uh, then see what happens as you practice with that. Okay? Everybody understand what I'm suggesting? Okay.
And if anybody has either had an intention and followed it or didn't have an intention, and what else happened? Any, any takers? <laughs> I think you should start. Okay, I will. But I, I, I wanted to be aware of her body. But then I got to not go into much. But I wanted to think about the toes, feet on floor, ankles, bones of lower and upper legs, knees, I forgot the knees, <laughs> sitting bones, as my right upper long ago writing teacher called them, aware of the spine, shoulders, neck, head. Feel fingers and wrists, but then what about knuckles and fingernails and, and then veins and corpuscles? And I started thinking I hadn't spelled that correctly. And then I started <laughs> thinking about the interior, and then we were done. So that's where I went. Um, and I don't even know if I ever came back to the bread. Got too involved. Anybody else? Anybody want to share? Yes. Yeah. Reed, were you actually writing? No. Oh, no, 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 no. So no. when you said you wondered if you spelled that wrong, I was while you were meditating. No, no, no. no I wasn't spelling. Yeah, you know, that sounds like me. I, yeah, but I, I wasn't spelling while meditating. But I, it could, it could have been. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. But you know, that was after. <laughs> Good catch. But that's something that could happen. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Counting, spelling. Mm -hmm. You yeah. Carol, well, you Carol. No. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, we got a gun. Yep. Well, I too was decided because of something Here. Carol said. I'm sorry. Um, because of some, when, when she was talking about the intention, I couldn't think of any intention. And then she mentioned being aware of your body. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where I went. But um, so then I felt like I was hyper aware of my body. The seat of my chair was really hard. I had a little bit of a headache. I mean, uh -huh. And as soon as I um, kind of went back to my breath, uh, all of that sort of receded so that it wasn't. Um, and I felt that trying to be aware of my body took away from um, being able to just be here. Mm -hmm. um, it became a, a what she calls a storyline or something. It does for me. When it, it, was, it was distracting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I was paying too much attention to mm -hmm. um, how my body was feeling. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that seemed to distract from uh, just being present and being here. Yeah, I realize I... I, I had to come back, and I, it was almost like I had to tell myself to relax and stop paying attention to those things. Well, I realize, I, uh, in some ways, not that I'm, I'm real fond of saying there's no way to do anything wrong, but I did something wrong here, which is um, to give you two sort of um, dueling instructions. Uh, and so um, those of you that caught that, good. <laughs> and uh, the thing about it that makes me not cringe too much is uh, that, that you learn something even when, you know, when somebody gives you dueling instructions and you say, am I supposed to be paying attention to my breath or to, to this thing I intended uh, to do, well, you know? So, uh, you know, however, I mean, this is a, um, work in progress. Life is a work in progress. And uh, meeting your mind is a work in progress. And um, a lot of times we live our ordinary everyday lives with dueling intentions. Um, and, and we can't avoid that because we have multiple things that are important to us and that we're working on. So learning to watch how you work with that when you have that is a valuable thing to do. So thank you for sharing that. I don't know if it's off the subject or not, but there's a wonderful book by um, an old friend of my mother's. The book is called Through an Eastern Window, and he, had, he goes far, far away. I think he, was in, he might have been in Japan, but he might actually might have been in Japan, and he was he, traveling in order to have a, a kind of Zen experience, and all he could do for the first little while, a couple of days, maybe a week, 
um, he just kept on thinking about how he couldn't sit, sit correctly and there was something wrong with his knee. And, he was, and of course, he put all this in the book. And, and to my mind, it was just wonderful to realize that um, this happens to everybody, uh, no matter what, and no matter where you are. Um, so I, I think I think we're okay. <laughs> Mostly. Mom. Yeah. We're, we're, we're okay, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting. It's, you can feel your, um, you can feel your willingness to relax and be okay regardless of how things are. And that's kind of the ultimate okayness uh, because things, so, all right, you asked me to share, I will. So my resolution, or my intention, was to open to space. I just thought, I'll just try opening to space and see what that's like. And first I felt a relaxation and then I felt areas of density in my body. And especially in my body, I felt old patterns crack under the pressure of space. And I could feel that happening. Um, light permeates outer, I was very aware, especially because those lights shine right in my eyes, very aware of outer light, but also feeling that sense of inner light that we all have. Uh, and then um, skittering thoughts of self-doubt. So the, the, the sort of, um, you sit up here and you try to talk to people and you don't know whether, oh, let's see if I can do that the other way. I sit up here and I talk to people and I don't know whether uh, I'm connecting or not. And so it's very nice to see people nod their heads and resonate. And it's also interesting to see when people don't seem to connect. And so um, all in the middle of my intention to open to space came this sudden solidification of self-doubt. And But it was skittering, so it wasn't heavy. It was just kind of, oh, okay, well, <laughs> what are you gonna do? So that was mine. <laughs> that was mine. Absolutely, nobody has to say anything. But if anybody has has a mistake to share, anything that happened during this last little exercise, feel free. Do you not recommend a mantra of some kind, something to say that will long be like a simple as well? You know, it, uh, I would view that kind of a mantra uh, as uh, the same kind of training wheels as counting your breath. It's like if, it, if you feel like your mind is um, busy and you're having a hard time sticking with your breath, then that can be a kind of support for that. But um, the idea here is actually, when I said that the point of this meditation is to learn to tell the difference between when you're caught up in thoughts and when you're simply present, um, to a certain extent, although those training wheels can be useful in training your mind, the idea here is that at some point, there is no difference between meditation and not meditating. There is just completely being awake and living your life un unencumbered by the filters of habitual pattern. Does that make sense? So therefore, whatever helps you to, to get your mind to the place where you can relax and open into wakeful presence and just being here is useful. But at a certain point, anything that may have been useful at some point can become an encumbrance later on especially if you tend to hang on to it, because there is that fear of space makes us want a mantra or to count our breaths or to have something to hold on to. And so when you notice that, you know, like your observation about cheating, when you notice that, you realize, oh, well, I wonder what it would be like if I just let go and, uh, you know, let there be space. When I was trained in this technique first, the instruction that was given to us by the Tibetan teacher that I learned from was to, be with your breath as it goes out and dissolves into space. And that was the instruction we were given. And, um, you know, it, it's a very interesting instruction because it does tend to, um, to encourage letting go. But on the other hand, it also tends to encourage spacing out and not actually s disciplining yourself. And at a certain point after he died and uh, his son took over the organization, he looked around and he said, you people are not taming your minds. And so he had us 
lower our gaze very low and start counting our breaths because he realized that we were just, you know, we were just sitting there, you know. I learned to sit there for a while, but you're not really uh, working with training your mind. And so I would say you are the best judge always of what your mind is doing in any given moment. Nobody in here can know what anybody else's mind is like. And that's just a simple fact, you know? So you're the best judge, but if you notice that you're always doing that, then you might want to try doing it without that and see what that's like, okay? You don't look satisfied with that answer. Oh, you know, I, think I'm, I guess I'm getting confused in my mind right now mindfulness, like you're out, for example, you're walking, you can't attention to the words, you're not thinking about the stuff, you're there, uh -huh. that's mindfulness. I guess I'm saying that is different than overdoing. Right, well, and, and to the extent that you are able to do that, um, then yes, that's, that's perfectly, that is mindfulness. If you're out and you're just paying attention, your sense perceptions are arising and you're experiencing them. But if you're out taking a walk and your sense perceptions are arising and experience, you're experiencing the birds and everything, and then that reminds you that you need to take the bird feeder down because the bears are out. And, and then you start thinking about your neighbor who saw a bear and then, you know, and on goes mind. That's the way it goes. So then at, at that point, you aren't present on your walk anymore, you're caught in your thoughts. So this kind of training helps you catch yourself more quickly when your mind begins to spin out of the present moment into something else, discursiveness, rehashing, rehearsing, whatever. Does that make sense? Good, good. Okay, good. So I, oh, yeah. So actually, uh, I want to set an intention uh, during this most recent meditation, but, but before I noticed a lot of physical sensations. That was what I noticed in the previous meditation we did. Um, I felt my heart beating, feel it in my body, I felt sort of warm in my face, uh, and I had a lot less sort of mental chatter than normal. It was much more dominated by physical feelings. Uh, and then I set my intention, and my intention was to be gentle, something I want to sort of cultivate generally in the market. But, um, but so I had, I, I had that happen and I stopped having any sort of physical experiences. I started having a lot more thoughts of others. I thought of uh, my sister who's coming in tonight. She should get in around midnight. And my brother-in-law and their little year and a half old, my nephew, he's real cute. <laughs> uh, I started thinking about a friend that I haven't seen in almost 10 years that I plan on meeting up with soon who also has a, a young kid, and I was thinking about what he spends his time on, and I thought of probably a lot that's on his kid. Um, and so I, I noticed a lot more mental chatter, uh, even though I had, you know, I had sort of set this intention to you know, more. And it was interesting having that experience come so shortly after I had just had such a very different experience. Just right. a few minutes before. You know what arises in my mind when you say that is that you set the intention to be gentle, and then you found yourself thinking about all these people that you feel gentle toward. So, you know, there's, there's something there that, that um, you know, actually seems like you followed through with that intention because the idea of, and then I hope you were gentle with yourself and didn't give yourself a hard time about, you know. But that, that seems very apt. And that's, that's what I meant about setting an intention. It, and, and we will go further with sort of, you can actually do it more actively. You can, if you've got a troubling situation, difficulty at work or with family members or something, you can use these tools to cultivate insight, or to invite insight to arise about how to work with things. So I want to just, there's one more uh, page here that I want to just sort of give you an overview of where we're going over the next uh, three classes. So mindfulness is this practice that of, of what we just did, coming back, uh, using uh, a reference point in the present to come back and notice and tell the difference between when you're present and when you're not. But mindfulness in, in itself is not a goal. Mindfulness is... Uh, 
the ability to stay present, to direct and sustain our attention where we want it to be, is a, a um, faculty that we cultivate so that we can fully inhabit our lives in the most skillful and wholehearted way possible. So we cultivate mindfulness to, do, to recognize the contrast and develop confidence in our ability to, to rest in the basic state of being awake. And then we detect the patterns. We become familiar with our inner habitual patterns and recognize our reactivity. And then we see that enables us to see the patterns in the world around us more clearly. Because the more you know about yourself, the more you are able to see what you're projecting out onto the world. Does that make sense? So, so that's the value of detecting the inner patterns so that we can more clearly see the patterns in the world around us. And then the more we do that, the bigger our perspective gets. We realize the uh, commonalities. We realize the interconnectedness. We realize that in this world where it's uh, so many people seem to um, take refuge in blaming others for the problems that exist. So when you cultivate this perspective, you begin to realize that uh, we humans have uh, a common task, uh, which is to learn how to live together respectfully and with respect for our environment in a way that makes it possible for there to be future generations of humans who can do that. So uh, this bigger perspective of, of our commonalities and our interconnectedness um, would be daunting if it weren't for this thing that also comes along with uh, developing uh, uh, the ability to work with your own mind is that you begin to trust the workability of situations. You begin to realize that you can actually find common ground even with people that you may not agree with about a lot of things, uh, but you can find ways to work. Um, it's the antidote to nihilism. You don't give up. We don't give up. We, this world is workable, and, and uh, with humor and resilience, we can find the ways to work with it. And then fi finally, the spaciousness that we create through our willingness to simply sit and be present with whatever comes up in our lives, in our minds, when we're practicing, brings us insight. And that insight allows us to see how we can be skillful in working with others and how we can um, accomplish our goals without causing grief to other human beings. So I think that's the sort of overview of where we're going. Anybody got any questions or um, comments or observations or anything? I, I'm fascinated that, and of course I, I should have known this, but that you're saying mindfulness isn't, isn't a, a place to attain. It's not like, like nirvana or something. Mindfulness is a way Yes, right. It's a, it, it's a faculty. Now, th that's not everybody's perspective on mindfulness, but that's what I'm teaching. Th that's why the applying is just as important as the mindfulness. You know, it's, it's how, what does it allow us to do? What are the applications of it? You know, a lot of people, back when I started doing this practice uh, in the 70s, uh, a lot of people thought, you know, what's the point? It's navel gazing, they used to call it. You know, you're just sitting around focusing on yourself. What a ridiculous thing to do. And, um, you know, I think now science has caught up, certainly, with the fact that, that mindfulness brings all kinds of different benefits. But the, but the other thing that has happened is that our, our culture has kind of um, um, moved in the direction of understanding that, that we need to understand our own inner lives in order to be able to live well in the world around us. And so how do we go about understanding our inner lives? Uh, and, um, you know, even if you could afford therapy and you could take, you know, go into therapy for as, as long as you wanted, you still have to do the work yourself. Uh, even a good therapist can only sort of help point you, offer you prompts, uh, a mirror reflection. This technique is a way, if you really apply it, this technique is a way of 
offering yourself that mirror, offering yourself those prompts. So, yeah, and then once you gain that um, familiarity with your own inner state, uh, then you uh, have much more clarity uh, about the world around you. So, um, I would like to um, invite you all, uh, if you'd like to have a little bit more of an opportunity to sit together, um, it, I think it's two weeks from uh, tomorrow night, is that right, May the, May the 13th, 16th. Yes, three weeks from ten, three weeks from tomorrow night, um, we'll be at UCC, which used to be North Church, I think, um, and so and it will not be like this. I'm not going to give another talk. We're just going to sit and we'll, we're going to discuss uh, practice or questions or anything. Um, the idea being that the more of us who are uh, paying attention to uh, working with our minds, uh, the more likely we're going to be able to um, reach the tipping point in our society where people take responsibility for uh, not polluting the world around them energetically. Uh, people have sort of, a lot of us have understood that we don't want to pollute the world physically, but we don't necessarily uh, think of our moods and our uh, behavior as uh, being a kind of energetic pollution. And yet it is. And so we can um, clean up the world that way too. That's good timing, right? Clean up days coming up. Um, so I, I, in between, I really like to encourage you to um, uh, use the journaling technique, just a few notes, but actually track your progress, track your discipline. And um, if you have signed up uh, for, um, I'm thinking for the people that don't have email, if, how many people here don't have email? <laughs> You're going to hide. I'm going to send it to Scott, so if you, if you want the prompts, you can come check with Scott. Um, I'm going to send out a couple of prompts in the intervening three weeks. Uh, just invitations, just like I did tonight, set an intention. Just an invitation. Feel free to ignore it if you want to uh, or, or play with it. Uh, you know, adapt it to suit whatever you feel like is going on in your life and your practice. But just a way of kind of reminding you, that way if you've forgotten to practice for a few days, you get a prompt from me, you might think, oh, well, maybe I'll sit down tomorrow morning or whatever. Okay, anything else? Are we good? Okay, good. Thank you all for being here.